you. Thank you. Cool. First of all, thanks that all of you are here. I'm actually super, super impressed by how many people want to spend their evening with Vadim and me. That's very, very honoring. Um, first of all, like, what is it about? Did you see that? It's, it's about starting product teams from scratch. I think that's it's a bit funny to say if, if you're like a company about 850 employees, it's not really from scratch, right? But um, a group of people, actually seven in, in total, were sent, set out to Barcelona to build up a new office in Barcelona to build up all the operations. And basically, we started out, we had a co-working space, we had some computers, that's it. And this is basically the story. It's, it's not really me teaching you something. I think I'm not that far in my career to teach anyone anything. But it's more like I want to share a personal story. I want to share the learnings we had. I think some of them will be definitely be applicable to young entrepreneurs, to people just starting out, maybe having their first team, maybe having their fifth team. I try to make it as generic as possible, not as in I just talk super high level, but as in, hey, you don't need to be a Series D funded company in Berlin to do that. Cool. So basically, it's all about Barcelona, all about starting product teams, and uh, all about fun. Cool. That's, uh, that's me a couple of months ago. Um, <laughs> I just wore down like Berlin. I, I put on the bow because Berlin wears you down. But basically, just to give you like 20 seconds of me, um, I was a founder at age 15. I studied computer science and economics. I was a freelancer for three years. I was the first employee at Eat Clever. That's a Hamburg-based startup. And now I'm working for N26 for roughly two years already. Very, very happy to, to have joined back then and now have seen this massive scale. I think some of you maybe know. Maybe I can get actually can ask, how many of you really do know N26? Oh, that's cool. How many of you have an account? Much more important. <laughs> Oof. How many of you have a premium account, black or metal? Yes, you are my best friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on this product together with uh, one of my favorite colleagues, Akash. Um, Cool. Just to give you some super, super quick background to set the context um, for you just to have a baseline. We are operating in 24 markets in Europe and like also some non-Euro countries. Uh, we are expanding to Switzerland, a small dot line, dot line here. We are expanding to uh, North America, or more or less like the United States. And I think Max Teintal, our founder, also announced, I think last week, that we will also expand to Brazil, hopefully this year. So very big plans. And just to give you like an overview of what do we want to achieve, what do we want to build, what do we want to bring to this world, our vision is to build the bank that the world loves to use. And I think there is like three main components to this, to this vision statement. First, I think it's, it's a bank. A lot of startups, especially in fintech, ha have rather been debundling services, have built like a small subset of, of, the, of the old banking solutions. And we took a step back and said, no, we want to actually own the entire, entire value proposition. That's number one. Number two is the world. We, Initially, I think we're more targeting Germany, Austria. Then we thought, okay, no, let's, let's go broader. Let's also take some bigger other European markets. Now we went for entire Europe. And now I think entire Europe is not enough anymore. Now we want to go to, yeah, North America, South America, all across. And then love, is, I think, is a, is, a use, uh, is a word that's very hard to use in the context of banking, I think, usually. I think you, you might agree. I, I see some nodding faces. Uh, but this is something we want to change. And that's, I think, also like the vision. And that's, that's, the only, that's the only way how you can go to this massive growth if you, if you create something people actually do love and not just have to use. Cool. I think what is this talk going to be about? I, just, I, I try to keep it super snappy, short, not too long. I would rather uh, uh, like discuss with you on questions and, and inter interact with you that way. Um, so what is it about? I think it's generally about our scale and the setup. How do we operate? It's about challenges we, we face like while scaling in Barcelona. I think we, we were set out with seven people. Now we are at roughly 55 people in Barcelona already after only four and a half months. It's purely, it's just like backend engineers, front-end engineers, QA engineers. It's a pure product and tech or R&D hub, however you want to call it. Next one is also how to overcome the initial paralysis. I think it has been, it's been a very challenging time, for sure the most challenging time at least I have seen it in 26 for me personally, but I think also for all the other people involved. It's just crazy at times. And then just very generic also, about what gets harder at scale? What is it that you, try, that you should look out for? And I think because we went from 7 to 55, this is something probably very applicable to this room as well. Cool. Hola Barcelona. This is uh, what we posted back then. It's not, it's really, really, I promise you, it's not to make you jealous, but um, I can promise you it's very, very nice over there. Um, I, I, I sometimes miss, Bas uh, miss Berlin, but uh, I'm very happy to go back to Barcelona tomorrow morning. <laughs> no offense. 
yeah, as I said, we we sc we scaled from from seven to fifty five people already. Um, I can pr I can tell you, not, no one of us has ever done anything like this. It's it's for us all the first time, building up a new office, building up this team, building up, taking over teams that already existed in Berlin, bring them over to Barcelona. That has been I can promise you, not 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 very easy. I want to introduce you quickly to to the initial team. The, the people we brought over from from from, Bas uh, from Berlin to Barcelona. That's Alina. She's a tech lead on the on the left, and there's Rarish. There's Andrea. Rarish is also tech lead. Rar uh, Alina, Andrea. She's a uh, she's our lead agile coach, and we have Blake as a designer. Akash also in product. Uh, Stand for security and tech ops, and also then there's me. And I think this is again this is not about my learnings only. This is really also all due to this team, but also due to the team that we the fantastic team we hired in in Barcelona. It's really really amazing. Um, for you to, to have some background on, like I said, the scale, the setup. Maybe it's interesting also to understand how do we take this decision? How do we, I mean, I, I will not talk about how we took the decision to, to go to Barcelona. I think that this, this has been taken by, by other people, but I will tell you about like how we came about to decide which teams go over and what, what, like, what, are, what are the principles behind, behind our reasoning or behind, uh, behind our thinking. First, one very, very important um, principle of ours was to give these people, to give this team a very clear and common KPI set because otherwise, Otherwise, like, we, we didn't want to create some sort of agency over there in Barcelona. We didn't want to create like an office which you turn to whenever you need something. That's not the case. We wanted to, to create like an R&D hub, like a, like a satellite place that can have their own culture, that can create their own rules, that will work on, on separate but also very important products. Another p topic w was that we, we basically anticipated that communi uh, communication would be super hard at scale. And that's why we said, okay, let's... What are the teams, what are the, what, are the, what are the product teams that we can theoretically bring over that are not too closely coupled to all the rest? Because as you can imagine, if we would bring over payments, that would be super, super hard because that's at the core of, of what we do. That's like the biggest team actually. Then, as I said, like the importance of the product was super important for us. Yeah. Um, we brought over memberships and like, as you can imagine, that's a, it's a big revenue driver for us. And we also brought over all of the other, most of the other revenue driving features. So basically, we took most of our revenue and brought it over to Barcelona. And that was just, we, we just took this decision very like, deliberately because we wanted to give this, this location a very, very clear purpose. And then, yeah, it was super important for us to also go cross-functionally because if we would have gone with payment teams, which are usually back-end driven, this would have meant we couldn't tap into the entire uh, talent pool because Barcelona has a very big talent pool. Spain in general has a very big talent pool. We also can attract a lot of people from South South, uh, South America, who can, uh, who can continue to speak their native language, and that's just like some reasons why we went there and some reasons why we put the money making, the revenue driving features over, over there. That was uh, more or less our phase when we all got the news, hey, you seven, you are going to, to Barcelona. I think it was, ex this, that was super, super exciting. I was extremely happy, but also some, somehow we looked like this. I think we were blown away by, by the initial thoughts. As I said, no one of us ever did anything like this. We had no idea how, how it will play out. We just knew it's an office in Barcelona. You can go there. You can book a flight now and uh, you'll have a flat over there, more or less. Um, but it, like it started out with super, super simple things. Like how do you get... We have like in, in Berlin, we, every Wednesday we get f uh, free food and we have a like brown bag and, and we have a presentation. How did you set up this, this food? That's like, it sounds like a small issue, but like actually it is not that easy if, if all of you have already one job, which is to build products and to, to build up the teams and you had all these logistics. But then it was also to train people, or maybe even earlier to find them. We, we do have by now like a very, very good um, setup to, to hire people. We like our funnel is very streamlined, especially for engineers, but it was still a massive challenge. But then also like, I think one month in, we had roughly five engineers sitting over there who were all new, who all had no context to, to what we do exactly. I mean, they were all super new. We, we, like, you cannot judge them for this. And that was, that was I think, one of the biggest challenges initially. How you can take these people that have no context and how can you give them context? How can you make sure that you actually set them up for success? And they were like, I think this onboarding and this, this cross-office communication, we, we really had no idea what we were getting into. And then also, Fabio is a, is a colleague of, of ours, He's a, he's a principal engineer and he said, hey, but please people, don't forget, this is not vacation, please don't drink too much sangria. And I think this uh, has ever since been very much in, in our heads, that this is not vacation, we shouldn't drink too much sangria. <laughs> um, cool, I think there's like three, three main topics in this presentation. One will be this like, hyper growth component, which maybe is not about like, necessarily starting from scratch, but more about the setup and like, how, we, how we think about growth, how, how we operate and like, yeah, how, how it all, all comes together. 
I think this is like the, the, the initial point is also how to scale balancedly. Um, that is something, what, 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 does balance, what does balance mean in this, in this case? I think in general people, everybody has like a shortage of engineers. That's I think no news to, to any one of you. But we were hiring so quickly because our funnel was so optimized that at, at the beginning we were like, okay, how, how will we ever be able to, to handle this? And then also like some, some things we learned uh, along the way is that it's of course it's very great to hire only senior engineers because they will be much faster like in, in after like some months. But this also means you have to think about the team constellation because if you only have like five leaders, who's going to like do the do the gr heavy heavy groundwork also? And that's like something we, we learned across the way. And this has been really not easy in the beginning because again you have we had like 10, 15, 20 engineers who were all like new and like who were all there for maybe one or two or three months and who could, of course, like help each other a bit, but at the end of the day, it was really, it, it came all down to Rarish and Alina as, as like the technical people to, to really give them the, the onboarding they would need, and like Akash and I could only, could only give them so much of information because that's, that's what we know about the technical infrastructure. I think this, 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 this point of balance and also, that, that's one of the key points that we, that we learned. That is, like, you, 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 of course, you can hire at all costs, you can just, um, just scale up with whoever you find, but like, I think at N26, our, our bar is extremely high, and that makes it, really, really hard to also think about topics like diversity. Because if you only look for, for senior engineers in Barcelona, then like the, the pool of female, maybe senior engineers, isn't that big anymore. And maybe some of them are already super happy at their job. And that was, that was like, is one of the challenges we, we face now, we face back then, and we really tackle all the time. Then just to iterate, what is, what is hypergrowth? Maybe some of you have seen this chart in, in other presentations before. I think that's like the usual growth is below 20%, 20% meaning um, compound annual growth rate, basically in this case, it can be anything. It can be your customer base, it can be your employee base, it can be whatever base you want it to be. Um, usually below 20% is most ordinary companies, not necessarily startups, can be, can be any given company. Then most oftenly startups are in rapid growth, where maybe you raise 10 million in, in a series A or B round, and then you start to scale, and then you grow by like between 20 and 40%. And we, I think we are like way, way above this. We, I, I don't know the number, but we are definitely way past 40%, where we grow every year with way more than 40% of, of headcount and also way more than 40% uh, in, uh, in, in customers. So this is like, what, what, what this, this chart has been shown to us, like I think over the last couple of months um, very frequently, but this is really something that, that, that we keep on iterating because like what this chart shows, of course, it shows success and it, it's all great, but it also shows that you should be really, really um, prepared for a lot of storm. You should be, should be prepared for, for things that will not work out and you will not even know why they don't work out because like, it's just overwhelming. There's just way too much to do and you like, at times don't even know what to focus on because there's so much. So I think hypergrowth is like something great. Like it's, it's one of the best problems I think you can have in life if you, if you grow so quickly that you don't even know like, how it's <laughs> happening. But I think that's really like one of the big challenges we, we face. I think other examples, and like now we're comparing us to, I think one of like a few of the best companies in, in the world in general. I think there, there's Uber who grew from 75 to 300 in one year. That's like, you can, you can, do, you can do the math, it's more than 200% growth rate. Then you have Twitter from 100 to 4,000 in four years. That's like, I don't, I <laughs> the number is just a way of everything. And then you have like Slack growing from 80 to 320 in 2015, and also Spotify. And I don't know why the numbers are so odd. That's what uh, they uh, communicate from 311 to 2162 within uh, five years. Um, yeah, and that's I think something that that, that, we, that we that we look at, and that's of course companies that we benchmark against. That's also companies that we that we talk to frequently and try to learn as much as possible from them. And that's uh, that's a nice quote I think published in in first round. Um, it's basically the law of startup physics. <laughs> um, humans grow linearly, while companies grow exponentially. That's something actually Akash brought brought to my attention this this entire article and this like this quote. And this is something I think that's that's very interesting because the, our our company grows definitely like super crazy exponentially, um, and we we all know that like it's it's really really hard to keep up with these these changes inside a company uh, because like at the end of the day. People, you, like you can, you can only stretch people that, that far. Like it's, it's not possible to like stretch someone exponentially. It just doesn't work. And it's something to always keep in mind that you really should think of, okay, where, where, where in this company can I go to actually fulfill the right position? Because like you cannot just imagine you are the first employee and like three years later you'll be the, the C something O. It just doesn't always work. Like you, you, do, you do have to grow with this. And I think just to, 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 to sum this up, I think the, the article also says that founders, of course, are an exception. Founders do can can grow uh, exponentially. 
So I was talking about structure, how we are set up. I think that's, um, that's, our, that's our segment structure for, for product and tech. PNT stands for product and tech. Um, we have six segments. Each of, these, each of these segments also has like a counterpart in the C-level on the leadership. I think it's a, can quickly run through with like solutions. That's actually the, the segment that we put into, like put to Barcelona. That contains like the memberships, like black and metal, but that also contains like overdraft, credit, savings, invest, insurance. That's all in operating out of Barcelona by now. Um, then of course, like, I mean, the, the main KPI is of course like revenue or like unit economics or whatever you want to look at. Then there is, then there's growth. I think super straightforward. How, 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 like what is the growth rate that you have? Um, CMO is of course like the, the counterpart over there. Then the platform, CTO is a counterpart. How do, how do you scale? Does it work? Can you go to Brazil and, and, uh, and all the other countries that, that we want to go to? I was nearly spoiling another one. Um, <laughs> then there is, then there is, come, come again? No, 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 I won't, don't worry. <laughs> um, then, there is, then there is assistance, I think that's like one, given that we grow so crazily, I think the, the customer base grows crazily, but you can also not grow customer service that fast. That's why we decided, okay, how can we, wh what can we build with, like, with technical efforts to, to, like, to not have the, the customer context grow? And I think by now we are super happy that the, to a certain degree the customer contacts are flat, while the customer base is growing exponentially. So that's, I think, a very big achievement from, from this segment in particular. Then local markets, given that we want to ex uh, expand to that many markets, that many big markets, we just have like, we will set up dedicated teams to facilitate this. We already have a team in New York working exactly on the New York or like working on the US expansion. Um, we have activity, takes care of uh, features like spaces that some of you might know, also works on other like super, super exciting things. Um, yeah, as the name says, activity, how often do people log in? That's of course just a, like a proxy metric. It's not, not the right metric we look at. We just look at general, like what do people do inside the app? How often do they return, churn, et cetera, et cetera. And then yeah, back at solutions. So I think some things that we really took away and um, some of these things are really, again, super technical like, or have been driven by, by Lean and Ravish from, from the tech side, but this is like mostly onboarding and, and, and the buddy system we, we introduced. I think we realized, yes, you can give people like an onboarding of two or three weeks in, in Berlin. That, that was our initial hypothesis. Doesn't work because like the, like the relation just doesn't work. Like someone is in Barcelona, will be in Barcelona, is onboarded on Berlin topics, doesn't make any sense. That's why we like, sw like swiftly switched to like have people in Berlin as short as possible to give them some company background, but then to bring them over to, to Barcelona as quick as possible. Where in the beginning, again, only Ragas and Alina sat there and had to onboard like tons of people, but I think they were super tricky and had like <coughs> great, great ideas. They started out with something that's common. I think pair programming is something they, they, they introduced, which of course doesn't really scale if you are two people and then you have like 20 on the other side. Um, and then they also, we also tried mob programming where it's like you, you go into one meeting room with like maybe four or five, six engineers, one person types, the other five people think and like think about the concept, infra, uh, architecture, etc. That's something I think we realized pair, program, pair programming works better than mob programming. But we did like tons of things. We had onboarding cones where people basically have to go through like tutorials, but based on your company. Like you don't give them generic things, but you say, hey, please accomplish this result in our code base. Like, and then like this is how you can do it. And this, that's the solution also. I think that's super cool. And then buddies, that's something we, we had in Berlin. I think then sometimes we, we just grew too crazy because like I think by now way, way more than 50% of the company are new. Like new as in are there for, for less than one year. And that's, that's, I think, crazy. And that's why we also decided, because some people also, from, like, they, they, they come to Barcelona, they have no, no background in the company, they have no background in the city, they have yeah, just zero background. And that's why we decided to pair them up with someone that has been in the company for a longer time already, to give them general onboarding, as in, this is how you, this is how you find around in the city, this is like our, our general guidances, this is what we want to do, this is our, like, our vision, this is what we, want, what, what we stand for at N26. But they also, of course, give them technical guidance and like they, they help them because like now the, the, the first people are like already there for five, six months and they can, of course, step up the game and they can like take, take care of this. They can onboard more and more people. And I think that's one of the biggest achievements that we also had is that we, we have all of these new people, but like they, they still take care and they, 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 they take over responsibility. But that's something you really carefully have to design because in the beginning, as I said, we had um, all senior engineers. And by, 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 by definition or like by proxy, you would think all of them are leaders. All will like drive the ship like just forward. But at the end of the day, you, you suffer from something like, like, by, like the bystander effect, where you have so many people that no one does anything. Like I'm exaggerating, of course. But um, this, this also happens in emails. You, you maybe have seen this. Like you send an email to 10 people. Weirdly, no one responds. Not because you send a stupid email, but just because everybody relies on the other one. 
and the same like happened to, to some degree also in, in Barcelona where we wanted to scale, we wanted to build massively fast, but in the beginning like we just had no responsibilities and we, we had also people that have no background. So like I think we, we faced these, these big problems and at, at times we were running in circles, but I think by now we, we have these, th this team of more than 50 people who were just like running super smooth, like it's, it's going better and better and better every, every sprint that we, that we have. And yeah, that's I think what we did in this regard. Then, does communication scale? <laughs> I can, I can spoil, yes it does, but not really well. Um, especially not if you're growing so fast where, again, no one has background. There's like our seven people, I think most of, like all of us are in the company for more than two years by now. Um, we, we do have this background, but again, it, it, does, it doesn't scale in Barcelona, where we, we seven, we cannot onboard like 50 people on the other side, but also like we seven cannot hold all communications back to Berlin, because even, even this doesn't really scale, because like at, at in Berlin there's so many people now that I don't even know, being here for two years, and that's, I think, something we have really, really realized. Um, again, some, some background. We have, uh, by now, three, or like, we have three locations. In Berlin, we have three offices, but um, for, only for the reasons of real estate. Um, we are also now in, in Barcelona, and as I mentioned, we are in New York City. We have 850 employees, and very, very proud to, to say that we have more than 60 nationalities. I think that's, of course, due to, due to Berlin as a, as a great, great location to found, but also due to our efforts in, in finding diverse talent and finding and looking into talent pools where no one else is looking. Um, cool. Then for remote communication. This is something we, we face. This is a problem we have right now. This is a problem, much bigger problem we had five or six months ago. But we basically did, I think, four or five key things. We have a, we have a weekly meeting for, for product and tech, which is just called very randomly P&T planning. <laughs> Um, not really creative, but nonetheless, this is a meeting with roughly more or less, it's a 30 minute meeting for 40 people are more or less interested. It's like product managers and then the leadership. And this is something we have every Friday. We, in the beginning, we use it more for, for like reporting to like give the leadership an impression of what has been accomplished in this given week. And this is something we realized over the time that yes, it's, it's okay. Like we, we, we do have some value in this meeting, but we need to evolve it. Also given that we operate in three different locations, actually like in four or five different offices, that just doesn't scale. Like you cannot only look at what you did, but we, we started to evolve this meeting into more of like a celebration at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the week. Because at scale, you have no idea anymore what, like, what is happening on the left side, what is happening on the right side. Like I'm, I'm happy if I know what's happening on my side. Um, and, and that's something we really learned, that like celebration is helpful, looking into what is the release, what is happening, what, 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 what are you guys actually doing, like what have you been doing the last week, it's just very, very important to celebrate, to come together, to, to, to like also have like maybe some of these moments where you just chat around, enjoy these 30 minutes at the end of the week. Then, yeah, coordinating releases. Um, we by now, I think I counted before I came here, we have 26 different teams, something like this. And of course, like if you if you have like backend releases, anyways, is uh, run by a CI/CD, so there's no no big communication needed. But our front end releases, they are of like if we release to the to the app stores, they are of course like different different game. We we coordinate them. We have them every every third week. It's like a release train, basically, always like on the same the same cadence. But this is like huge communication by now. I think at this point we are, we are close. We could like probably hire one person that only does this. At this point, we just like switch the, the switch responsibility. There's always one or two product managers that take care of the release. But this is, as you can imagine, across 26 teams, out of which mostly like at least at least 30 percent, but more like 60 percent of them actually want to put any, something into release, <coughs> gets super crazy. And also there, we, we use the PNT planning again as as a celebration, but we also use it very hands down to sit down. When is the next release? Who is responsible? What goes in there? How does it look? When do we communicate it? And I think that has been very, very helpful for us to structure this meeting in a very, very clear manner to, to, yeah, to get the most value out of it and also to like, just have ev everybody on the same page as much as possible. Then remote work unequals centralized work. I think this is like now not, not, this, not a crazy smartest thing to say. It's like, I think it's quite obvious. But n nonetheless, we, we learned it really the hard way. Um, it starts at super simple things. It starts at, the, at your setup. If you if you if you like hang like you use Google Hangouts or something via your computer, the quality is usually quite bad. And then if you have multiple people in the room, you will not hear anyone, someone. And like you, you just hear your meetings get super inefficient. That's one thing. You cannot really use whiteboards anymore because like someone on the other side cannot see them. We at times like use a camera to look to point at the whiteboard, and you can probably imagine how well that worked. Um, but, but there is like tons of other things. There's like something small, which I have not been really bothering about because I know most of the company, but new joiners said, yeah, but like no one has photos in Slack. No one has their job title in Slack. 
And this is something, if you're like, if you're 50 people, if you're 150, 250, doesn't really matter. But once you have that many people in the cross offices where they have never seen each other, it is a big, big problem because like you, you should give some, some value, you should give some, some meaning to, to, the, to a person because otherwise like you just become robots interacting with each other. And that's something we realized, you do have to design your entire company in a different way. And by this I mean, like N26 has been historically like a very centralized company. We have been, most of us have been working in the same office in Berlin, in Berlin Mitte, and we, we've been seeing each other every day. We had no need to, um, we had no need to like think about remote cultures or anything that we, that we do because we also have no remote uh, colleagues. But this is really changing now and everybody feels the pain. So that's something we, we definitely have to improve on the way to do it. But uh, still, as, 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 as a lot of these things work in progress. Then longer term planning, I think also like being remote is like has, been, has been super crucial for us to at least every, every quarter, once, once per quarter, have some sort of like offsite where some product managers, by now not everybody anymore, but like most of them come together and yeah, plan out the next quarter. And uh, I remember I had a different talk, I think one year ago, and I said something like, um, fuck, fuck, really, fuck uh, quarterly roadmaps or something. And I think now looking back, um, it was still the right thing to say at the time. But by now, one year later, I think it's something I, I would definitely not say anymore. No, I did, but uh, um, it's something I, I wouldn't say anymore because I think it, it is extremely important for a company to, 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 like, to give, give some structure. And like the quarter is, like, I think, just a nice, 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 nice cadence you can, you can use. And what we do basically is we, we all go into a room. There's like people from, from product, people from tech, people from marketing, I think some, some other people as well. And we just look at, okay, every product team puts up what they, what they think is the right thing to do in this quarter, then we align them based on times, because sometimes you need a different team to do something for you so you can do your part, and that's something we align, but we also think about, okay, how can we bundle things to have better marketing releases? How can we like, use this? And this is something that we have not been doing before. Everybody did whatever they wanted to do, at what, whenever they wanted to do, and we just had some major projects like the UK when we went there. Of course, we had more communication, but still. This is something we get better like day by day or like quarter by quarter, and something I can recommend like you recommend to you if you think there is like missing missing alignment because like these quarterly things have like benefits, especially the, I think the biggest benefit is if you work for a company where like everybody has ideas, people will and you are a product manager, everybody comes to you and says like yeah but I have this idea look I have the data looking at Vadim hopefully they have data, um, but still like it, it would just annoy you because like you cannot help them in the, in this moment but given that you have like a three or like a quarterly cadence it actually it is helpful because you can say sorry um our quarter is planned please come back to me in like two months and we can discuss it that's i think super helpful for everyone in the business then i think gsdd getting stuff done days just like a small small input in, in what we what, what we also do to like have more of this, this remote culture or like of the, of the culture in general um this is something we do every sixth week two days is basically not given off to the company, but basically they don't have to do their regular work. There is no, nearly no meetings. Of course, if you, if you really have to, you will do have a meeting. <coughs> but in general, there's no meetings. You can just do, you can, what, you can work on whatever you want. You can do it alone. You can do it in teams, in pairs, and you can really create whatever you want. And this is something we've been seeing because this is also a very great opportunity for us to present it back to Berlin and to show, hey, that, that, that's what we have been doing in, in Barcelona. And that's like, I think, a very nice as rhythm and also I can just recommend it's, it's, it's two very nice days and you also have super cool output every, 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 every time. Then rituals, um, something I had also had to learn the hard way, your, your rituals or like the rituals will be your best friend for, for very sure, I can, I can, I can assure. Um, I think one thing that people might not take so serious because like agile is also one of these buzzwords that like maybe, they, they did, like it didn't lose its meaning but I think people have like run over it but I can really assure you if you set up a new team a very st strict strict cadence or like a very strict rituals will be your very, very best friend. Because the team has been, is, is lacking context all the time and at least you can give them something which is like structure. They know there is a planning every other uh, Wednesday, there is like a review every other Tuesday, retro, all of this. It's not crazy, like you don't have to be like a genius to, to set this up, it's like creating five calendar events. <coughs> but this gives your team like an immense structure. And especially if you have been doing like product for a longer time, you maybe forget how valuable this is to give structure, to compress something, to like really, to like put these people into like into motion. I can just uh, assure, underline. Then inceptions. That's a, the concept we adopted, I think like roughly a year ago already. And this is also has, has been super helpful in, in Barcelona because what basically what the inception is, it's like a, it's like a, like a two to five day workshop, depends on the scope of, of whatever you want to accomplish. Everybody that will work on this project uh, like basically goes into a room you can imagine it that, that way that you have a solution more or less mapped out, 
but you like need the finishing touches, you need the stories, you need to think of, break it down basically, understand why do we want to do this again? Like how do we do it? How do we do it not, what is not included? And basically that's something we, we go through. We just look, we, we take a step back because as you can imagine, most engineers are also particularly hold, held back from, from the day-to-day -day work as a, as a PM or day-to-day -day work as a business. And it's really good to give them some background and say, okay, that's the user we built this for. And also this is what, who's involved, who's on the other side, who, who do we work with from, from inside the company. But also like what is included in this feature or project or product, whatever you build. But even equally important, what is not included. Because I mean, there is this nice, nice, uh, nice image where you see like three people thinking, one thinks about a square, one about like a, like a um, pyramid, like a triangle and someone else about something else. And then all of them think they are in line and all of them think they, they think the same, but they usually don't do. And these things like also risk mapping, story mapping, etc., really, really help get a team on board. Because like you can imagine our teams right now in Barcelona, they aren't fragile because like we now went past this point, but they are still very new and we really have to give them as much structure as possible. And that's a, a method that's really helpful. Uh, vision mission, I think that's also something, it's a similar concept, but you, but you basically take it like one level, one level higher. On like we basically, when we, when we set up our membership group in, in Barcelona, we basically did a vision mission workshop, 10 people or 15 people are roughly involved. We created like a mission statement. Um, it also is like hanging in our, in our office right now, it's just for people to again iterate and iterate and iterate. Wha what, what is our goal? What are the people that we cater? Why do we do it? And then basically that's it. And it's something that is created usually like over one or two days in a, in a nice workshop. It is very exhausting, but I think, again, it's, it's definitely worth the effort, even though you like, as a product manager, you do have to prepare quite a bit in what you want to accomplish over the next X month and why and what's the, what's the, what's the, what is the research telling you, qualitative, quantitative, what's the benchmark, what are the other products using, doing. I think that that's a lot of work, but it's really worth it. User research, that's again, something that, a, a ritual that really helps you get into a, into a cadence. Um, that's more or less our, our user research um, process. I think you said you like you have objectives, you have created hypothesis, you choose which methods methods are you do you want to use, that you basically conduct it, you synthesize it, and the entire loop starts again. By now we, we set it up in a way where we do user research for the membership group every every Tuesday uh, every second uh, Thursday. We get in eight people from from Barcelona or like in nearby, and we just interview them mostly. We do like usability testing, thinking about okay. The solution that we have over here doesn't work for you. What doesn't work for you? Why does it work for you? Maybe we also, like last, last time, we did like a card sorting exercise because we had this one screen and we, we didn't know exactly which information a user wants to see. And we just asked them, hey, here's like 10, 10 potential things. Which of, these, which of these do you want to see there? Why? Which do you want to see earlier? Which do you want to see later? This is something you anyways only find out by user research. This is not a user research talk, but in general, it really, it really helps you to also give this team again from a different side. I mean, Blake, our designer, has been in the company for a super long time. He, he knows the ins and outs, but still, because like, this creates content for the team also every second week, we can share it back with them. We, can, we also usually invite our front-end engineers to, to participate, to, to also see some users, to give them some background in, in what they do and what also what their problems are. Because we always, like as a PM, you always think of problems in a very, a very different way. You, you think that the problems are like this, but actually the user comes and tells you something way more fundamental, which you, because you use it every day mostly, you, have, you overlook. And that's something you really see here, and that's also how you get, get, get buy-in from the team for your solutions. Then post-mortems. This is something also super interesting. We also again roughly introduced one year, one year ago. Um, it's a bit, bit of a scary name, I think. But anyways, it's um, basically whenever something happens in a company that wasn't supposed to happen that way. It doesn't need to be something sp uh, specifically bad. Can be like delivery issues, can be something way different, can be a service that was off during the night, can be like a migration that didn't work that well, whatever, it can be anything. It doesn't need to be something, something terrible. But still, we, whenever something happens that we think is like, is like post-mortem worthy, we, we sit down in the group of people that have been involved in this, and we basically also again run through it and we do this, we write an incident report, we think about what are the effects, what did we do to intervene, what, are the, what is the root cause, and also like how can we now take actions to prevent this from happening again. And this is like one of these like continuous improvement loops which you can apply, which also again give structure to the team because they know, okay, if, something, if everything works well, great. If something doesn't work so well, no finger pointing, nothing. We have a post-mortem, we discuss it. Again, no finger pointing. We really think, look, about, uh, look into what is the problem, how can we solve it, how can we address it for, for the future. Again, giving a lot of structure for the team. Cool. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Let's have some questions. <laughs> um, I have a question about the, 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 the people who are working in Barcelona. 
Uh, is it, um, you mentioned there's a, a whole bunch of engineers. Uh, is there like an ops team also working there with you, uh, running the office and, and so on? Um, at this point, no. We, like the, the office basically purely consists of product managers, designers, engineers of all sorts, QA, back and front, and et cetera, and also like the, the agile function in general, but like this I take into like tech in general. So we only have these three, three disciplines, of course design as well, but like also they are more in product, I think. So we have these four disciplines, that's it, no operations. There is also no boss in the office. That's, I think, one of the great things. It's a, to, to some degree, it's like a distributed office because like everybody has their responsibility. No one holds the responsibility. And that's, I think, something also like, which is part of the success, that we don't have this one person we look up to, but we, like, we, we share the responsibility. This is also makes it much easier to give away a chunk of responsibility to a new joiner. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, sorry, this is a rather rough question. Um, surprised to see the US expansion. Uh, is there any plans um, that N26 is going into Asian market, or maybe in how many years do you guys see yourself entering the Asian market? Maybe Singapore, I don't know. Um, I think, first of all, I'm not entitled to answer this question to like my knowledge, which I might have. I think this is more of a question you should ask Max or Valentin in, in a Q&A. But just to like give a, give a general answer, that like I can repeat what they, what they also say. I mean, we, we do have investors which are based in China and Japan, I think, Tencent and, and also like other people. Horizon, and um, this is of course like we, we look into these markets. We I think by n at this point we we know that these markets are much more advanced than Europe and in the US. I mean US you can you would imagine like it's super crazy like everything is super modern. Not really the case. We in Europe are actually like one or two years ahead of them, but like Japan and like all these countries over there are way much ahead of us. And that's why at this point we 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 monitor it and we look into like what they are doing. We of course like keep track of what, what's happening there, but there is like no active plans to, to go there anytime soon. I think you had a different question, right? Yeah. That's it? Okay, cool. <laughs> Hi, back here? Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, well, um, I'm working as well for a German startup and we do have one IT location in Barcelona. We even share an investor together. Um, Which one? But, uh, Horizon Ventures. We're sharing That's together. great. And uh, we are definitely not the stage where you are at now, but I question myself, how do you make sure that the right people are talking to each other um, across the country, so you have multiple locations, and how do they actually know to whom I should talk? Um, I mean, in, in regards to the second question, knowing to whom you should talk, I think that's pretty straightforward. The thing is, we seven people, we hold quite a bit of the knowledge. We, we can, like, whenever, whatever you ask me, like, who should I talk to for X, I will usually be able to give you an answer. That's, I think, the benefit we have right now. It's, it's, it's arguable how we can solve this going forward when we, when we seven people go back to, to, uh, to Berlin because we are like on more temporary assignments, basically. Um, that's, I think, one of the big challenges. And in general, I think, how, how do you solve other problems? Like there's this, these communication problems, mostly we solve them, and this is really hard, actually, like, because it's, it's much of a habit. When, whenever I, I want to talk to, for example, today, I wanted to talk to Rarish because I was like, he knows the solution, he will give me an answer in like three seconds, but then I realized, okay, if I ask him, of course, I get the answer quicker, but if I, ask the, if, if I ask Udin, he will maybe have to look into it for a bit, but once I ask him, he has the knowledge and he can spread it in the company. Because like, again, we don't want to have single points of failure with like, individual people, and I think that's, that's basically my trick. Just don't talk to the people you would talk to, but like, make other people find it out for you, and then they know and they can spread the knowledge. Otherwise, you, you, like, you create single points of failure. Thank you. Hey. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, cool question. on. You know, a lot of startups that go in, in other countries or build a, a new team in other location, they typically appoint like a, some, somehow like a director or someone that is in charge of that. I don't have the feeling that that's what happened with you guys. Do you think that that could help in the govern, governance to have someone that is kind of responsible of the whole development or was not really helpful in your case? I mean, to, to, to some degree we have this, right? I mean, we, we, we operate particularly and like very dedicatedly in a very global, global manner. We, we have a CPO who oversees, or she oversees, entire, the entire like, um, product development across all places. We have a CTO who oversees things across all three locations. I think that's, that's super helpful. And uh, we also, like, th this is how we kind of centralize it. We d do talk to Berlin, and with these people, they come over frequently, so we, we get to have a good, good relation, good exchange. But we also, with, with our principal engineer, Stefan, I think he, he, like, he is someone that we can always turn to for all these important decisions. And like, basically, by this, we... But we, again, we don't have this person to talk to, but you know, like after a while you, you create, like automatically um, structures establish themselves where you know, okay, this is the person to talk to for this decision. This is the person to talk to for this decision. And at this point we are quite implicit. Like you, there is no, 
there's no page where you can look, okay, that's the decision, who do I talk to? I think we will at one point for sure have to create something like this for the people, especially once we once we leave leave the office. But um, I think at this point it, it works quite well by having our our global people in in Berlin. And I think there is different different um, ways of, of doing this. I think Skyscanner, for example, another com a company f I think from Barcelona, no, not from Barcelona, but in Barcelona, and um, they have their executives all over the world. I think I, I talked to one of the um, PM leads and. And she has also been saying uh, there is advantages for sure because like she she has like one of the directors very close to her, but on the other hand, like there is also disadvantages because like you can never really get these people into one room because everybody would have to fly in. Right now we can fly to Berlin or like they can fly over, but mostly we fly to Berlin and then we can have like super important decisions or like discussions in in like for one hour and like there is no big overhead. So I think both both solutions have like pros and cons, but that's ours for now. Um, if you have to start again this remote office in Barcelona, what would you do differently? Because you talked about a lot of different things, but what was like basically the biggest challenge or the thing that you think you would do differently? I think we would maybe be more strict. Not as in strict to people. Like I think we, like, um, we, we always do the same. Like, we have super high expectations, but we give people the room to breathe and to do whatever they think is right. But I think we, we would have to set up these rituals way earlier. Because like we we thought because in Berlin you know, you know after like one year of running a team you can loosen these these rituals a lot you can like think okay do we really need this today nah let's skip it let's give the team some time back but this this we tried in the beginning in Barcelona as well like ah let's be like a bit more like less affair let's let's be like uh, flexible but this flexibility turned out not to be very helpful because then you have like people sitting in this room with like three question marks above their head not knowing what's happening. And I think that's. I think we would just like set up these rules, like uh, not rules, but like, set up these like this cadence much earlier. Be a bit more stricter, and also do, like, super small, sm small things that we that we only learned later. For example, like being being the, the seven people that come from the different office, to some degree you do have to be like a role model if you want it or not. People will see what you're doing and will replicate this behavior. If you establish a culture where you always take uh, your uh, your laptop into the meeting, you like chat with other people, you check WhatsApp. People will do it as well, but if, if you if you stay focused, if you never never put out your phone, if you always are with the people, then you can create a different different um, environment. And this I think this is what we learned quite early, but this is what I would do now even more. Like think exactly, be very explicit in what you want. Yeah. Thanks a lot.